Welcome back to Normalize the Conversation. My name is Francesca Reichter. I'm the founder of Inspiring My Generation, and I'm here with special guest Alessandra Corsani, actress and founder of the Emotional Support Podcast, which is absolutely amazing. Thank you so much for joining me. Oh my gosh, thank you so much. Can we just talk about how cute, first of all, you are. Secondly, how like a serendipitous this was. I never had done a live Instagram where I asked people to come on, um, like random, you know, people who requested. And I saw your feed inspiring my generation. And I was like, oh my gosh, like that seems fun. And then you came on and you had all this exciting stuff to say about mental health. And I was like, I need to talk to you again. Like you're just adorable and doing so much for your generation. So thank you very much. Thank you. And that was absolutely amazing that you had done it that day. And I'm so lucky that you had chose me because I was listening to your podcast right before that. And I got the notification that you were going live and I was like, oh my God. Oh my gosh. What are the, uh, see, some things are just meant to be. I know that sounds super juju, but it's like some things really are truly meant to be. It's so true. So how did you decide to start the Emotional Support Podcast? Well, through a series of very unfortunate events, um, it basically really the foundation of it came from is I was diagnosed with bipolar disorder a little over 10 years ago. I was told not to speak about it as an actress because it would label me as difficult or a diva or whatnot, um, even though none of that was the case. Uh, I was silently suffering. And I had started being open about my diagnosis on Instagram TV, like you do. And slowly, all of these different companies started coming to me and saying, hey, can you come speak at this panel or can you come to this event? And I went to an event with um, not influencers, people, who, but sort of, they're all in the mental health field. And it was about 60 to 80 people. And they had everyone come together who have platforms to figure out you know, here's um, the idea of mental health. What can we do to spread awareness? And I talk a lot. And so the people that were there said, hey, why don't you start a podcast? And it was something I always wanted to do. And I always wanted to speak about mental health, but I didn't know how to start a podcast. I'm like, who's going to listen to this? Like mental health is kind of boring for some people. Um, and people, you know, resonated and they responded so much that it made me continue to want to do it. That's amazing. And what I love about your podcast first, most podcasts that talk about mental health, they make it so serious and boring that it's hard to want to really engage and listen and feel like you're part of the conversation versus your podcast. You know, you're always laughing during it. You're always making everyone else laugh and, you know, and it just, it lightens it because it's such a heavy conversation. There's such tough conversations. You can't have them in dark, depressive tones because people aren't going, they might relate to it, but they're going to relate to it to a point where they're back in that dark tone. They're like, wow, that's how I feel. Versus you make it light, make it, you want to have that conversation. Totally. And I think that that was a lot of the problem that I had is I am someone that just my whole goal in life is to make people laugh because it's when I feel happiest. Um, and probably my own insecurity of that's how I have to have conversations with people <laughs> is like through laughter. Um, but I would listen to all these other mental health podcasts and I think, and mental health shows and, you know, I, I totally respect the scientific aspect of it all. I respect doctors. That's why I love having them on as well on the show, but it became so mundane and it was the same thing over and over. And it just made me feel worse about myself. And I was just kind of like, no, I'm good. I don't, I don't want to hear about this anymore. I have to live in this depressing manic stage my entire life. I don't need someone else to talk about it. And I really had a hard time I don't know if you feel this way or your, you know, your listeners out there. I had a hard time with doctors and professionals talking about bipolar disorder who weren't bipolar and didn't really understand the day-to-day -day struggle that they were going through, that I was going through. And so I thought, you know what, I'm just going to share my story, whether people want to come on the show or not, that's on them. And I just want to laugh and make light of it and make it a little naughty and swear on the show and, and be just real and graphic because I think that 
that's the important part. And I, and I've been really lucky this season to have people from different aspects of the mental health world. You know, I had a nutritionist on, which was really exciting because I'd never spoken to a nutritionist before about mental health. Um, I had someone who was, you know, um, a specialist in, in, in sex and female anatomy and all this. And so that was really interesting to hear how your mental health affects, you know, your sexuality. So there's been so many cool different people who have come on to share stories and kind of give the tools where first season was mostly celebrity heavy. And then second was like, is, or is it's still going is more, um, what are the tools to help, help you out? And then we'll probably go back to a little celebrity and then go back to the tools again, you know? And I love that because you're having these conversations that other people aren't having. You know, it's so easy for someone who specializes in mental health to sit down and read to you what they've learned and what they've studied. And although everything they've studied and learned is amazing and it's so important and helpful for all of us, if they can't relate to it and put it into a story and tell you how it affects you in multiple ways, it's not going to give enough value to the person listening. It's not going to be as right. relatable versus when you're talking about sexuality and you're talking about sex drive and how that's affected by mental health and how, when you're feeling depressed, it might be more difficult. That's something that's so powerful. And so many men and women go through and they couldn't, didn't know that and they could relate mm -hmm. to it. And it's like, wow, I didn't know that that could be connected. And when you go into nutrition, how what you eat could affect your mental health. There's mm -hmm. so many things that people don't realize. And if people like you weren't having these conversations, no one would know that I'm really not alone. There are so many people out there. And it's so funny because I hate hearing my own voice, which is ironic because I have a podcast, but I hate hearing my own voice. And I never like to hear interviews that I do because it's so painful for me because I'm like, oh my God, I sound terrible. Like, oh, what is this hoarse voice? Um, but I do listen to my show because I love it, not because of me, but I love hearing everyone else's opinions, their conversations, their knowledge that they bring to the table. And you know, when I do an interview like this, I, I certainly am listening and I'm certainly engaging, but there's a lot of moments that I miss. And when I go back and listen to it, I'm like, oh, okay, you know what? I'm going to jot that down of something that I'm going to try. Or, you know, a, another guest that I had on, um, a wonderful gentleman named Jacob Moore and had me write these steps down and I've done these five steps and I'm like, Oh my God, that really helped, you know? So, so it's really cool because I actually take the information for myself, which I wouldn't usually do if I was listening to myself on another show, you know, I wouldn't think, Oh, I should do this. It's just hearing these guests. I've just been really lucky that they're, they're informative. They are. And that one podcast was absolutely incredible. I was re-listening to it the other day because I wanted, it was like, I need to find out more about this because it was like the five bridges. Yes. The five, and, yes. Five bridges. Thank you. Oh my God. I feel so stupid. No, I just goodness. did another interview. So I'm like thrown off. I'm trying to think of like there. Anyways. Yes. The five bridges. <laughs> You're good. But I had to re listen to it to remember that and to go through it. I was like, wow, I want to write all these down and learn from it. There's so much valuable information in all of your podcasts that you can learn from that all of us can go back to and listen to it a million times. And you learn something new every time you re-listen to it. It's just, oh, that makes incredible. me so happy that, that I have listeners. <laughs> <laughs> I usually listen like the day it comes out, it's Tuesday, but for some reason this week, I couldn't get to it until this morning. I listened to it and I was like, I'm so happy. I listened to oh. Kyle Ayer. I don't know if I pronounced it. Yeah, name. Kyle Ayers. Isn't he funny? So funny. And I loved how he talked about like as a comedian, he doesn't know if his career is ever going to go back to the way it was. And I think so many right. people around the world are struggling with that. Is yeah, my life going to go back? Is my career, is what I studied, what I trained for, what I know, is that all still going to be there? And that's affecting mental health on such a massive scale. And I love that he took that and had that conversation with you. And I, it's so funny because I don't think that he even expected, I don't think a, he knew what my show was about, which is so funny. Cause I did his show and he was like, yeah, I'll come on your show. Like I'll do your mental health show. And then it was like, Oh, we're getting like really real right now. And he was so open and honest. And I said to him afterwards, I was like, listen, Kyle, you know, if there's anything that's like too personal and he's like, no, 
because this is the truth and this is what's happening. And I am struggling every single day thinking about is this where my career is? And that is exactly what you're saying right now is the feedback that I've gotten most for his episode is, wow, to hear someone whose career was taking off and how everything's been put on pause. And is this still going to be what it's what it was like less than a year ago? You know, and everyone's going through that and whatever their occupation is. Yeah. And with mental health, it's really taking a massive toll on that, those questions. And a lot of people feel alone, like nobody else is going through this because you see on social media, everyone's posting all about the amazing lives they're living. And a lot of people are still trying to show off all the good things that are happening during this pandemic, which can be so great to see the positives. But when you have podcasts like yours and the content that you post on your page, not just the videos, but the actual like little quotes and stuff, is so powerful and so helpful because people can see oh. it alone. Um, there's people out there and everyone who's liking and commenting back. It's just these discussions and conversations that are just helping people. You're making my day right now and like my week and my month and my year because that's really, I have no idea what I'm doing in social um, with emotional support. I have no idea what I'm doing with these videos and I'm finding such amazing quotes. Not like none of them are really mine, but I'm finding them from other people. And, and it just really makes me happy to hear that that's, you know, something that's a, that you're absorbing. It's really making me happy. So thank you. I think it's absolutely incredible. And sometimes like with my foundation and my page, I'm like, I want to go and see what she's doing because I'm like, she you, you usually post something that's so good. I'm like, okay, I can take this and like, take it all, take, take it, it all, take it all. <laughs> <laughs> because there's so much valuable resources that people need and you're really providing that. You are oh, providing so many resources and valuable content, just information and words that people need to hear right now. And we're living oh, in a time that. where the suicide rate's increasing like crazy. So when someone oh. like you is posting something so impactful, you are single-handedly like, saving lives. Like it's just something so incredible. Stop it. You are so cute. <laughs> Listen, I'm just trying to, to I, I just did this one interview with this fantastic girl and she was talking about her, she had a breakdown, she got PTSD and she said the, the, I said to her, I was like, what is the one thing that changed that got you to write a play, got you to do all this? And she's like, literally, I got up one morning and I went on a walk. And she's like, and then the next day I went on a walk and I made food. And then the next day I went on a walk, I made food and I wrote. And she was like, it's baby steps. And I was like, wow, that I never even thought of it that way. It literally is baby steps every step of the way for you recovering or, you know, learning. And she's like, look, it took me two years to get where I am. And in two years, two years ago, you never would have thought that I could even get out of bed. She's like, but every day I would do one little moment different and better and, you know, just keep progressing in my life. That's amazing. Cause it really is baby steps. It's step by step. One little thing you can do every day that makes such a big difference. So how have you yeah. been coping with the pandemic and what have you been like not great? <laughs> <laughs> you know, it's hard. Um, you know, the one thing that I always say in the podcast, and I'm sure you've heard this a million times, um, is I'm very lucky that I was diagnosed the, t the, the days that I were 10 years ago that I've been able to find the tools to, handle isolation, depression, loneliness, um, suicidal thoughts, manic episodes. I've had 10 years to work on those tools um, where I find a lot of people that I'm friends with and I have family where they've never had to deal with anything, any of this before. They've never had to live inside their own mind um, and really sit with their thoughts. So I, I've been lucky in that sense where I, it's not quite a big of a shock to me, this whole like mental health crisis, but I am someone that needs physical connection with, with friends. I'm someone that needs hugs. Um, so that's been really, really tough and not being able to see family, um, but safety first. Uh, but uh, I was really high as a kite living my best life. The first two months of quarantine. And I was like, I'm going to get shit done. Oh, I, 
can't swear. I'm going to get stuff done. And like, you know, I was on it. I was like working out every single day. I was writing. I was meditating. I was taking my real estate license course. I was learning languages. And then one day it just all stopped. I just got really sad and, and depressed. And I was like, I don't want to do this anymore. And I stopped recording the podcast. I was like, no one's listening. You know, no people were listening, but for me, it wasn't what I expected it to be. And, um, I ended up, you know, going a different direction than the company I was working with at the time. And everything kind of fell on my plate where I was running thing that I want one other person helping me, but I was doing the social, I was doing the website, I was doing the merch, I was doing the recording, the editing, everything. And the weight on my shoulders finally just gave in. And I was like, I'm done. I'm not doing this anymore. Um, and then I had a dear friend of mine, Dr. Raghu Apasani, who I've interviewed twice. He said to me, he was like, you know, it's suicide, um, it's suicide awareness month. And you have to wake up and stop living in this, you know, hole that you're living in and realize that you do have a platform and people need this more than ever. And whether one person hears it or not, it doesn't matter. You have to do it. So if it wasn't for Raghu, I wouldn't be here right now doing the second season and kind of reframing how I wanted season two to be. And figuring out, you know what, I needed the tools to learn. And this is a learning experience for me. So maybe it can help other people. So really, I mean, it was like high and low <laughs> extremes. Yeah, this pandemic has been so difficult. And there's a lot of high and lows. And a lot of people who don't have mental health disorders don't realize how, yep. how high the highs can be and how low the lows can be. And I found like, for me, I had discovered like my mental health and been diagnosed with depression and anxiety about a year before this all happened. So I had about a year to get caught up on tools and resources and get myself right. to a place where if I hadn't done that, there was no way I would have made it through this pandemic being by myself right. in a town. I'm like five hours away from my family. So I'm not close to anyone. I'm on my own every day. And it's like navigating that's very difficult. And for those people who don't have the tools and who are suffering from depression, anxiety, bipolar disorder, OCD, PTSD, ADHD, they need these tools and resources. and by doing this podcast, by doing these videos, we're giving them the resources that they need that they haven't had. Either their therapy and treatment wasn't accessible to them and doctors weren't able, they couldn't afford to go to the doctor. The infrastructure right. around them didn't support them being able to go to the doctor. They just never knew that that was even a thing, that it was serious that people can really have mental health because I think there's a lot of stigma on who can get diagnosed and who can really have a mental health disorder and who can't. So a lot of people don't realize what right. it is and how it can actually affect everyone to be providing these tools and resources. It's absolutely. When awesome. did you start your IG TV series? I started it. I started it months and months ago, probably in like June, July. And then I deleted everything. I was like, I'm starting over and I'm going to start. Cause at first it was me having people send me questions and I was answering them. And I was like, it would be so much better to be having conversations. And I was listening to your podcast and I was like, I want to do something like this. Like I want to have, can I ask how you found it? Um, I think I was following someone. I was following someone probably maybe from the big bang theory. So then you came up as one of the suggested people. So I clicked on you and it said host of the motion Alice support podcast. So I clicked on that and I was like, wow, what's this? So That's wild. Suggestions. That is wild. No, I'm always so curious how people find, um, how people find the podcast because a lot of people will write in and they go, what do you do besides the podcast? I'm like, I'm an actress. I've been doing this for a long time, but people don't. Um, I find the listeners actually aren't just fans of, of, of work that I've done in the past. It's completely like a separate, it's like, I'm living a double life, which works because I'm a Gemini bipolar, but it's like a double life. It's like, I have my personal page, which is, you know, all about the acting and the fun and the other one, which is about mental health. And it's totally two different audiences. So it's so fascinating for me, how, how, um, people find it. Yeah. And it's so crazy how Instagram, like the algorithm can just connect you with like the right people to follow. Yeah. It's just bananas. Have you found it very therapeutic doing your, um, inspire my generation, uh, IG series? 
I have. It helps me so much when I'm having like those bad days, having conversations with people. Because again, like I'm by myself. So to talk to someone, I'm like, whoa, this is exciting. Right. And then right. to talk about mental health and have conversations and explore different avenues of mental health. You know, talk to people with ADHD, people with um, bipolar, people who are like a holistic nutritionist. I just did. I did one with cyberbullying. And it's just all these different little pieces. And it's like, wow, mental health is so much more vast than I ever could have imagined. And it takes up so Did you always, I'm sorry, did you always want to get involved with mental health? So I didn't. That was something that was so new to me. Um, I always wanted to like help people. So when I was 12 years old, I started a blog called Inspiring My Generation, which is why the name is what it is. And it was all about just helping like finding like little things I learned during the day and I would just share it on a blog. And then I made like a little podcast when I was 15, trying to do the same thing. And then my, um, I lost my uncle to suicide in 2019 and I had attempted suicide 27 days before. He had talked to me, found me, talked to me about mental health and the importance of getting help, help and therapy and medication, all that kind of stuff. The first person to really have that conversation with me, 27 days later, he died by suicide and I fell apart so badly. And I attempted suicide multiple more times, ended up in a mental hospital for a week. And I was so mad when I was in the mental hospital, the way we treat mental health. I was like, first of all, the funding is so low that I spent a night sleeping on a little chair in a room. I was like, yeah. I, and I was terrified out of my mind. I'm 19, 20 years old terrified and then um there was like there weren't books or movies or really anything to read or to do while you're there so when they have like these maybe group a group therapy session where they may read something to you and then that's it but there wasn't enough support and resources and things to do during the day to get through that time I was like why aren't there this is a perfect opportunity for self-help books or for fun books about reading just to get people to Mm -hmm. learn different coping mechanisms that are available And that wasn't the case. And there were so many people there who were freaking out about being able to afford it. And I've been so lucky and blessed in my life that that's not been a problem for me. And I didn't realize that's such a problem for so many people. They can't afford to get treatment, get help. They're terrified to admit that they have suicidal thoughts because they're going to end up getting, um, in Florida, we have Baker Act. They don't know what it is in every state, but that's where they hospitalize you if you have suicidal thoughts for 72 hours. People are afraid to admit that and get the help they need because they can't afford it because you're going to get the hospital bill from the ambulance that's going to come pick you up. Then from being there, from the food that you have, everything. So it just made me- Let alone the medication, you know? Yeah. And then they put you on medication as soon as you get in there. So by the time you get out, you're kind of starting to get dependent on it, starting to like it, starting to like how it's feeling and you want to continue. And it's like, can I continue? Can I afford to continue? And then if you don't continue- it's already kind of in your brain and your hormones. So when you come off of it, you can kind of spiral. So we're setting people up to fail with the mental health system in America. And I was so angry. I was like, I want to do something to make this better. So I just decided I was going to take Inspiring My Generation and turn it into mental health and try to raise money for treatment programs and get people who can't afford treatment, treatment that they need and to send encouragement cards to mental hospitals and make cards every month and send them just kind of providing. Oh my God, I want to make cards with you. Please do, because I I make like 200 a month and it's so much to make by myself. If you want to make a card, please, please. Oh my gosh, just tell me what I do. And I I have the worst handwriting, so (laughs) I'll probably have to type it out because people can't. A true story. I used to fail in my English classes all the time because they were like, oh, you're very good, but your handwriting is so bad and no one can ever read it. So I'll type it, but I'll sign it at the end. Um, but I would love to do that with you. Thank you. If anyone listening wants to make cards, like DM me and I will give you all the information. Please. It's exhausting. <laughs> right trying to do school and work and making and what are you what are you getting your master's in information systems and operations management but I'm going to do another that's computer coding and like software so I'm learning how to do like Java and Python and UML and um, SQL which has been a complete nightmare not my thing but I'm happy to be graduating in two weeks and then I am going to do a mental health counseling master's next Oh my gosh. Fantastic. Where are you going to do that? I'm assuming everything's online now. Um, so I'm just filling out applications. So I'm applying to 
Columbia, which is my dream, and then NYU and probably Fordham. So I want to be in New York, but like philanthropy capital of the world, I feel like that'd be such a great place to meet people to be able to build my nonprofit. But yeah. Oh my gosh. Oh my God, this is so exciting. <laughs> oh my gosh. Well, I am so happy that, uh, that, you know, the universe brought us together because I think that you are just the sweetest little like muffin of all time. And I just, I can't wait to post this interview on my page. I think that this is, this is so fun. I just love this. And do you have any other questions? Like, sorry, I'm like taking over your interview. (laughs) You're good. So one question I do have, because I think there's such this misconception on what bipolar is. I think people, you know, when someone's attitude goes from like they're happy to they're upset in a few minutes, they're like, oh, are you bipolar? You know, and that's something we see in TV shows. They make jokes about it in movies. And then in school, kids grow up not understanding what bipolar is. And Mm -hmm. even me as someone with depression, I have highs and lows as well. But it's very different than a manic episode you have with being bipolar. And a lot of people are like, oh, maybe you're bipolar. And I'm like, it's something that's so different and very misunderstood. So can you talk a little bit about what being bipolar is like and how you've learned to navigate it? Yeah, I mean, it's so funny that you say um, that it's so not aware of... uh, people have a lot of problems with bipolar disorder in the sense where even a neighbor I was talking to, I was telling him that I'm bipolar and he's like, no, you're not. That's the most misdiagnosed thing. I'm like, eh, do you want me to have my medicine? And then you'll really be able to tell what I am. But, um, but yeah, it is something that's so different and it's something that I'm actually learning about. And I just talked to, um, one of the heads of psychology at a university and she's studying a program. She's focusing a whole project on, on bipolar disorder right now. And I told her that I said, Oh, I'm diagnosed as bipolar one. There's bipolar one, bipolar two. I think there may be bipolar three. Now I have no idea. I'm like, so ill-informed about these things, but, um, but I know for mine that it is um, my highs are very high. My lows are very low and it can happen within a matter of minutes where I'm totally fine. It feels like there's a volcano in your stomach and you can feel the lava coming up and suddenly you can't handle it anymore and you explode. And whether that be throwing a phone across the room um, you know, never physically hurting anybody, but hurting yourself. Like there have been many times where I've punched mirrors. There have been many times where I've been so upset. Like I start hitting myself in the head. Cause I just like, I can't handle, um, the explosion that's going on inside my brain. Um, but what was fascinating and I, why I bring her up is I told her that I have these ups and downs and I said, Oh, I'm not like the bipolar two where, you know, you're depressed in bed for two weeks and then you're fine. And then you're in, you know, it, the, the, from the, what I had learned from other people is bipolar two is like very low and then a little bit high, but bipolar one is like, like out of control, like out of the universe. And then like bottom of the barrel, you know? And she said, actually what I have, she goes, is very rare, even in bipolar one. She says, people don't usually have the highs and lows. Sorry, my gardener just came. So (laughs) sorry, but um, she said, people don't really deal with the highs and lows like that, where it is so immediate, where it could be a matter of minutes. Um, She goes, or days. So that was something I learned yesterday. And I was like, oh, I had no idea. That was interesting. Um, But mostly what I would say from my experience is, Yes, I'm depressed. Yes, I don't want to leave bed, but then it'll be like one quick, you know, snap of the finger and I'm back to normal again. And then I'm feeling so good about myself and I'm so like, I'm the best. And then the second that that downfall hits, I'm like, I crash and burn, you know? Um, I hope that explains a little bit because it's still so hard for me to explain what it feels like. Uh, to put into words and and use my vocabulary um, or lack of um, <laughs> to to explain, but hopefully that kind of yeah, that's a, a really bit. good explanation because I think a lot of people think it's just like you know when someone says you know someone says something and then like your attitude changes so like you're bipolar. That's not what being yeah. bipolar is. And- I think I have very erratic behavior as well, where I find, you know, if something, you know, really like upsets me on Instagram or social, especially if someone makes like a rude comment, 
instead of just ignoring and, and something like, and be like, okay, you know, let them be. And I wish them the best. I'm someone that immediately will respond something like to like stand up for myself. And then I immediately block them. And I do that in my life too. I feel like if people are friends and, and it's to my detriment, I guess, because I, I don't allow people to be themselves and then take fault, you know, in their apologies or something. But it's like, if you wrong me that second, like I'm done, you know? And I think that that's a fault of my own, that people should be forgiven. People have to learn, they grow. And it's something I'm trying to work on, but that that's very much my personality. It's like mess with me once and like, bye, you know, I don't, I don't sit with my thoughts. I'm very, very irrational with my decisions. But that has to be really helpful when it comes to mental health, because as a public figure, you know, there's so many people who will just have a bad day and go on and just start attacking in the comments. I see yes. it all the time. And I'm like, how you don't know this person. How can you just go on? And someone had clapped back. I think it was Kate Beckinsale. And they responded. They're like, you're a public figure. You should be used to criticism. I can say whatever I want to you. But that's not how it is. And no, no, no you can't. And that breaks my heart that people really think that way. And it's affecting mental health. You can't. At the end of the day, we're humans, right? You know, everyone's a human just because you may be the most famous person in the world. It doesn't mean you're not a human and you don't have feelings and emotions. Exactly. No matter who you are, seeing these negative comments every day has to be painful and hurtful. You're not just absolutely because you're a public figure. It doesn't work that way. It's funny. I had someone that was so rude to me and then I deleted his comment um, because it was just the other day. And he, he said, you never respond to any of my things. You know, how much could you really care about people's mental health? And I didn't even know that this person had been writing me a bit. And finally, I wrote back. I'm like, you're right. I, I said something like, you're right. I should totally be responding to you because I don't care about anything. I, I don't care about anyone or I don't know. I said something. And then he was like, oh, thank you so much for responding to me. I'm so sorry. I didn't mean to hurt your feelings. And I was like, no, you're just an asshole because I didn't respond to you in a because you'd been asking things over and over and over. And I have my own life, you know, and I'm sorry if I forgot to write back and, and I'm ignoring you. I don't read my direct messages. I don't do any of these things like I use it to my my platform to share funny things, to make people laugh or informative things. And that's it. I'm not engaging with people. Um, I can't do that for my own mental health. Um, so when people do say those kind of things, I'm like, really? You know, you just wanted the attention. It wasn't about me ignoring you because of mental health. It was just, you just wanted attention. And that's so wrong. Exactly. And it's just this level of cyberbullying with this pandemic, everyone kind of being online, having all this pent up anger and frustration. It's been so terrible. So when you do see those comments, I know you said you block, but do you do they ever get inside your head? Do you ever like hundred percent? How do you hundred percent? I think a lot of people are bullied and they don't know how to handle these comments. They go through their mind and it's just, it's so heartbreaking to watch people fall apart because. I mean, I think about comments that people wrote me years ago. Like I consistently think about them. I remember when I went live on, um, on an Instagram, like at the beginning of the pandemic and I was just dancing and like having a good time. And I was like, everyone, let's have fun. Like, let's try to like release this. And all these people kept writing and they're like, you look so old. Like you have wrinkles. Like how old are you? And I'm like, I'm like, I do not have wrinkles. I'm like, this stuff is not wrinkles. They're expressions. Like, am I not allowed to move my face? You know? Oh, now the dogs are going crazy. <laughs> Hold that thought. Church. Can you get them? Thank you. My husband had to grab them. Um, can you hear me okay? The gardeners are just dogs. My dogs. My dogs, they're little. Um, but no, I do think about these things all the time. It never leaves your head, right? Especially the ones where they're rude like that. Like, I, I can't even imagine. I'm still talking about the one where the person said I look old. That was from eight months ago. Like, why am I still talking about it? Because it still affects me. Um, I don't think that there is anything really that I can say to help people out with cyberbullying. The only thing that I can say is, 
don't take my advice when when I say that I engage and I fire back at them because you're just giving them the attention that they deserve. And if people are going to be mean to you and they're going to be rude to you, they have so whether you think their life is perfect or not, they have so many insecurities and they are the most messed up and hurting and don't feel good about themselves ever. Even if you think they're the most gorgeous pe person in the world and they have all the money in the world, they're miserable inside if they're even acknowledging you as a human being and then being mean to you. Like, and at the end of the day, if someone is writing on your thing, guess what? They're obsessed with you because they're actually taking the time to write on your page. Exactly. So if you are being cyber bullied and someone is writing you, just know they're obsessed with you. They're obsessed because <laughs> if they really didn't like you and they really were ready to bully you, like they wouldn't even be looking at your Instagram. That's so just remember they're obsessed with you. <laughs> That's such great advice too for, I know a lot of high schoolers, you know, you're on social media, you're young and people can be very mean and then they take it and they bring it into school. Then they bring it back online. I remember when I was in high school, it feels like forever ago, but it was like five years ago. Um, I was like prom time and I posted a picture in my dress and I had an eating disorder back then. I was so thin. I had a solid six pack. I was very unhealthy. And someone had responded back like, you don't have the body for that dress. You're not thin enough. And I was at the height of an eating disorder and I spiraled so bad. I almost ended up hospitalized for my kidney shutting down after that. People don't realize that what you say really affects someone. And yeah. kids can't always logically and rationally understand and process it and realize that they're not being mean to you because something's wrong with you. It's because they're not feeling well for themselves. Yep. And they yep. happy people don't spread hate. They spread love and joy. Absolutely. And they're putting you down because they can't feel good about themselves. And the only way they can feel good about themselves is being mean to someone else. But at the end of the day, like my best form of advice, like if you're a cyber bully or you're being cyber bullied, you are obsessed with that person or you are someone's obsession. And if you're bullying someone, just know karma is a bitch. <laughs> <laughs> and it really is. And if you're being bullied, just know that person is obsessed with you and just feel flattered. Take that negative energy, turn it around and just be like, I am so sorry. You are so obsessed with my body. <laughs> right? I'm sorry. You know, I'm sorry. Love yourself for who you are because you're amazing. And anyone that hates just they're obsessed with you. I love that. And back to talking about Kind of living with bipolar um have you ha found that like certain coping mechanisms work better or worse i know you said like medication has been something that's so helpful and a lot of people are either pro medication or they're like i only use holistic and a lot of people don't like to use the mix so i was wondering do you use a mix are you very like eastern western medicine I do believe in both. I know that I have to be on my prescription medication um, to survive. Uh, so I am a firm believer if you are on the right medication. And I was wrongly medicated for like 20 years. So to finally be properly medicated, um, it feels great. And you should feel great on your medicine. If you don't, if something's wrong, go to your doctor. Uh, but I do believe in other, you know, things. I believe meditation is so good. I believe, you know, therapy is amazing. Writing your feelings down. For me, my biggest therapy is dancing. Um, I'm not someone who's like an exerciser. Uh, but whenever I am feeling sad and depressed, I will go outside and just take in the fresh air, put in some good music and, and go for a walk. I believe that that's a form of therapy and healing. Um, I believe in taking a bath. <laughs> I don't really believe in self-care, even though I do believe in it. If that makes sense. I also don't believe in like, Oh, put a post-it on the wall and it'll make you feel better because like that doesn't work for me. Like I need real stuff to make me feel better, but I do believe there are moments that you should really take care of yourself. And I think the most important thing is not surrounding yourself with people who are negative or not healthy for you. I think that's the best medicine that you can do is people that support your mental health. I agree. And those are all amazing coping mechanisms. I know I use literally every single one of those, especially journaling and writing down my feelings and what I'm going through, because if you can connect 
what you're feeling with how your body's reacting, how your mind's reacting, what happened before and after, you can kind of learn to understand your triggers a little better and understand yourself and find who you are and what is really affecting you so that you can live very happily and healthily. Absolutely. Absolutely. Have, have you ever tried breath work? You know, my husband does breath work. Um, I have tried it. I have, you know what you should do? You should follow a dear friend of mine. His name is Bryant Wood. He was, I think he was my first or second interview on emotional support. And I met him at this conference and he is a specialist in breath work. I think you should see his stuff. It's like amazing. It's like magical, but yes, I, I, I should get more into it. I just started it and a couple of weeks ago and it's been amazing like a game changer I wasn't sleeping I hadn't slept in like 10 weeks and I finally like did it and I think by my third session I was sleeping again I was like oh my gosh then you absolutely have to check out Brian and 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 learn from him because you know breathing is the most important thing we can do for our body yeah (laughs) truly it is we have to to survive you know and it's something we do without thinking about all the time so we never realize that practicing our breathing and paying attention to how we're breathing, how much we're breathing can be so helpful. I did this like neurofeedback therapy program like a year ago when I first started my mental health. And I learned that I, I took too many breaths in per minute. So I wasn't actually soothing my body. I was increasing my heart rate every time I was breathing all day. Wow. So I could never get calm. And that was such an amazing game changer with my anxiety because I had severe anxiety where I would throw up blood clots found out it's because I couldn't breathe. I couldn't get myself home. People don't realize that it's little things that we don't pay attention to that we never think about that could affect us in so many ways. Right, right, right. Mind blowing. It's really, it's really nuts how the littlest things actually can change your life. It is. And all those coping mechanisms you mentioned are something that are so helpful and everyone works differently. So just because journaling doesn't work for some people or like the affirmations, the sticky notes, like any little thing, it's not going to work for everyone. And finding what works for you is so incredibly important. And it takes a lot, a lot of time, even years to figure out what works for you, but it's all about trial and error. Exactly. And some things work at some point of your life and then they won't work in the future and it's okay. You can switch it up and keep practicing and learning more about yourself and rediscovering yourself. Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. Thank you so, so much. for. Oh my gosh. I mean, I could talk to you for hours, honestly. I'm like, oh my God, I could talk more. Um, But this was so fantastic. I think that you are inspiring not only your generation, the younger generation, my generation and an older generation. And I think that you have to continue doing what you're doing um, and share your lived experience because I think that that is the only way for people to really understand what they're going through is to hear other stories and know that they're not alone. Thank you. And again, with your podcast, you are absolutely incredible. I know it's helped me in so many ways and it's helping so many people and you are seriously saving lives. You're absolutely incredible. Thank you. Oh my gosh. I hope so. I hope so. And I would love to do, we should do another one of these soon. This was really fun. Please. And please, I want to help out with the letters. (laughs) 